you know, making quiet inquiries uh, with other people who I knew in the industry and uh, obtained verification of its existence going all the way back to at least 1973. Um, and uh, after that, uh, we found photography that had been shot by a military pilot in 1966 uh, near Provo, Utah, uh, the so-called Harvey Williams UFO photos, which were uh, an exact match with the so-called ARV. Um, but uh, I in the wake of all that, uh, I actually met uh, other people and found historical evidence to support the fact that Skunk Works had uh, a history of involvement with this sort of thing. It started out with an um, uh, organization called the Research Institute for Advanced Studies, or IAS, which had been conceived by George Trimble. It was uh, the Advanced uh, Propulsion and uh, Aviation uh, Vice President for Glenn L. Martin Company, which later absorbed uh, American Marietta Company, which became Martin Marietta, which eventually was absorbed into Lockheed Martin in 1995. And so all of this technology, all the research that was done by some of the leading investigators and scientists in, in gravity physics, Pasquale Jordan, Burkhard Heim, uh, Louis uh, Vuitton, 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 I should say, uh, um, these people were all brought in and uh, made a part of uh, Lockheed uh, and their investigation of gravity propulsion technology. And so... Uh, it was no surprise to hear that, uh, in fact, the Skunk Works was involved in this kind of thing. And, in fact, I've, I've spoken to people who have seen these craft coming and going, being launched from and recovered at Air Force Plant 42, where Skunk Works is located. Now, I've had occasion to see these craft on uh, many occasions myself uh, in or near military installations. Um, and I can tell you with a high level of confidence that there is some kind of an installation in the mountains west of Redding, California, where I live. And if you spend enough time uh, in the wee hours of the morning watching particular parts of the sky, mm -hmm. you can see these vehicles uh, descending into the same location in the mountains over there. Um, uh, actually, at, at precisely the same times each week. So, so tell me, are these... Are these craft uh, defense mechanisms? Well, if if uh, if I was to say that they are being operated by a civilian organization, mm -hmm. I, I think that would be false. I do I do believe that they are part of a uh, a highly classified military organization. Um, there's been some speculation that, in fact, they may be. Uh, used or employed by uh, one of the intelligence agencies of the United States, either the National Security Agency mm -hmm. or the Central Intelligence Agency. Uh, it has been noted that many of these so-called secret bases seem to be within uh, Indian reservations, of all things, and which, when you think about the original uh, mission statement of the CIA, which prevented it from operating inside the territory of the United States, uh, the idea of having it um, operate such facilities inside a, uh, an Indian reservation would actually uh, sort of maintain the letter of the law while at the same time allowing them to come from within the, uh, the continental United States. Is there a, an extraterrestrial connection with these aircraft? Well, you know, that's, that's strongly suggested by the, the title, um, Alien Reproduction Vehicle. And in fact, um, mm -hmm. I have a friend by the name of Paul Price, whose father uh, lived in Roswell, New Mexico, back in 1947, and was actually one of the first individuals to uh, visit the crash site of uh, the alleged UFO right. uh, prior to the time that the military had been notified and mm -hmm. sent out to that site to... Uh, to actually, um, uh, you know, secure the area and, and yeah. basically clean up everything that was left behind. And he maintains that uh, there are actually uh, parts that, uh, that are in the possession of family members that uh, go back to that time, and they're clearly not something from around here. You know, here we are so many years after Roswell, and there seems to be no conclusive evidence, physical evidence, that has surfaced to substantiate any of the any of the claims, and in today's day and age, I, I find that rather rare. Well, you know that's 
that, that is one of the things that's maintained by a lot of the press, that there's no physical evidence. Mm-hmm. But in fact, uh, there are a number of cases going back uh, into the 1940s and 1950s. For example, there was a, uh, a UFO explosion and crash just off the shoreline of Ubatuba, Brazil, back in the mid-1950s. Uh, there were a number of people who collected uh, specimens of the metal that uh, basically flew like uh, you know glowing embers from a fly, you know a fireworks mm-hmm. display, landed in the uh, shallow water near shore and were recovered by civilians. Uh, Jim and Coral Lawrenson, who were the founders of APRO and the writers of numerous UFO books, collected some of those samples and had them analyzed, and they were found to be an extremely rare isotope of magnesium. In fact, this particular isotope was so rare that even finding it uh, within industry was nearly impossible. But to find a, an isotope of this kind that was so extremely rare and to find it in a 99.999% purity, mm-hmm. uh, as in this example, suggested very strongly that it had to come from some off-world technology. Whatever happened to that piece of evidence? Well, as far as I know, uh, it was uh, seized by um, the uh, the U.S. government when it was submitted for testing. Um, you know, they did get the results from the testing back, but in the meantime, the uh, the samples seemed to disappear. That's not to say that one couldn't go back down to the coastline off the coast of Brazil there mm-hmm. and uh, look, uh, you know, make a survey and, sure. and uh, try to find additional specimens, but. Um, that was uh, that was what they uh, they described as finding in the analysis of the metal. Prior to them submitting the piece of metal for analysis, were there any any other people who actually saw it who could testify beyond a shadow of a doubt that they did indeed have this piece of metal? Well, I'm sure there was in the 1950s. Of course, mm-hmm. that was 60 years ago, and there's a good chance that uh, anyone still alive today probably would have been a child at that time. Right. Um, probably in their in their 80s or 90s, um, so it's hard to say. I mean, these these things are uh, very difficult to track down after so many years. But uh, you know, it's one of the problems you have with going back, even to you know the Roswell crash in 1947, is actually finding anyone who's alive today who actually witnessed the events. You and I have to take our news break at the bottom of the hour. Mark, please stand by. Great talking to you. Exonation Mark McCandlish is our special guest this hour. His website is www.markmccandlish.com. That's www.markmccandlish.com. My name is Rob McConnell, and this is The Exxon, a place where people dare to believe and dare to be heard Monday through Friday from 10 p.m. Eastern until 2 a.m. Eastern, right here from our broadcast center, in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. The Exxon, www.exxonradiotv.com will return after this news break with our special guest this hour, Mark McCandlish. Once again, if you'd like to visit Mark's website, it is www.markmccandlish.com. We'll be back on the other side of this news break. Don't go away. My name is Rob McConnell, and I would like to tell you about a very special lady that I have the pleasure of knowing, and that's Miss Sylvia Anthony. Sylvia Anthony believes the golden years are a time to gear up and get busy, not relax and take it easy. She has faced many hardships in her 84 years, but they have made her stronger and more determined. As founder and president of Sylvia's Haven, a shelter for women and their children near Boston, Sylvia has helped transform over 1,086 lives in the past 27 years, not only with housing, but also providing direction as to where they can go to develop the earning skills they want and need to live free from difficult domestic situations. Sylvia's Haven is everything to Sylvia Anthony, even calling it her magnificent obsession. Women who qualify for the program at Sylvia's Haven receive assistance via guidance counselors to find the appropriate job opportunity. Women and their children may remain at the housing for up to two years. 
At the end of this time, or sooner, a woman who is successfully employed and has an apartment or home may leave Sylvia's Haven to begin a new and independent life. Now this is where you come in to help make Sylvia's dream into a reality. Sylvia's dream is to have a Sylvia's Haven in every state to help as many women and their children as she can. And to help this dream come true, a crowdfunding site has been established which can be accessed at www.sylviasdream.org. Now that's www.sylviasdream.org. With your financial help and support, Sylvia Anthony will continue to help those in their time of need, not only in the Boston area, but with her dream of having a Sylvia's Haven in every state of the United States. Your help is needed to make Sylvia's dream come true. Please visit and give at www.sylviasdream.org. Once again, www.sylviasdream.org. And remember, the only difference between a dream and reality is just doing it. We need your help to make Sylvia's dream come true. Visit www.sylviasdream.org. Once again, www.sylviasdream.org. For the Exxon Radio TV show and the X Chronicles newspaper, I am Rob McConnell. This is the X-Zone Radio and TV Show on the X-Zone Broadcast Network and our worldwide broadcast affiliates. If you have a question for Rob McConnell or his guest, or if you have had a paranormal experience, call toll-free 1-800-610-7035, extension 0, or email xzone at xzoneradiotv.com. And on our major social media sites, our address is TV. Welcome back, everyone. Mark McCandlish is my guest of this hour. His website is www.markmccandlish.com. Mark, when it comes to this uh, this flux craft that, that you're talking about, mm-hmm. has it been seen recently by, by people who enjoy looking for UFOs in the night skies? And have any pictures of them surfaced on the Internet? Well, if you do go up and you look for the uh, the Harvey William photograph under uh, best uh, best UFO photos on record, I think is one of the websites, mm-hmm. you will find photographs of this particular craft. Um, if you go to my website, you can actually find um, a, a copy of the cutaway illustration that I did some years oh, ago. Oh, super. Uh, and in fact, uh, if anybody is interested, I, I do sell a blueprint of that cutaway for uh, for people who are interested in some of the call-outs and the details that identify some of the components inside the craft. And um, the, uh, this particular vehicle uh, is flat on the bottom, mm-hmm. has uh, sides that are sloping inward, uh, almost like you took a slice out of a cone. Uh, there's a uh, kind of a ledge about halfway up with a little bit of a, uh, a rounded surface that transitions into the, the dome in the center, which is really the top half of a perfect sphere which is a kind of uh, composite pultruded sphere. It's actually made up of an extremely long winding of composite materials wrapped around a spherical-shaped uh, mandrel. And then the, um, the, the, the sphere is actually split in half, and this flange is uh, attached to it uh, with a number of high-technology adhesives. And then those two flanges actually secure the primary windings of what happens to be a, a very large Tesla coil type of uh, mechanism that uh, is actually what forms that little ledge that's just outside the, uh, the belt line of the sphere. And uh, it turns out that there, there may be some mechanism within that design that actually incorporates uh, some of the uh, qualities referred to as frame dragging in the physics literature, where they're actually circulating a uh, kind of a mercury solution through a uh, copper winding that's embedded in a kind of a quartz material. 
Uh, it's very interesting to look at, but in some respects, it also functions like the primary windings of a Tesla coil, which is a, a device. It's like an open-air transformer. It actually takes a particular voltage generated within the vehicle and steps it up to a high, a much higher voltage, something in the millions of volts. Hmm. That electricity is then. Um,